If you look out your window and you see trees swaying and leaves blowing, you instinctively know that it's windy out. But you're not actually observing the wind, you're just seeing its effects. What if you actually wanted to see where the wind was? Sometimes you may not want to visualize data directly. Instead, you might want to take the data and use it as a source for creating new data, called derivative data or derived data. If you wanted to visualize the history of how a person moved as they walked through a room, you could attach motion trackers to a few points on their body and track the positions of those points. Then you could draw lines that show the movement of those points over time. These lines are a type of derivative data called streamlines. You can trace streamlines through any type of data that has motion or flow. Imagine that you took a handful of leaves or particles and threw it into a tornado data set. The wind attribute would carry those particles through the data. If you trace the path of each particle with a streamline, you could see how the wind moved over time, which would give you a better understanding of the motion of the wind than just trying to visualize it as a volume directly. You can trace streamlines to show other types of flow, like currents in the ocean or the magnetic field on the surface of a star. Streamlines are just one of many types of derivative data. Now let's say you have a CT scan or MRI of a human body. The scan may return a volume that has everything that's in your body in it. Skin, muscle, bones, organs. But a doctor may just be interested in viewing one piece of that, whichever part is making you sick. You can pull out specific features of a data set by using isosurfaces. If you know that skin has a density of about 1 gram per centimeter squared, and bone has a density of about 1,000 grams per centimeter squared, you can use these as your isosurface values to pull out different shapes in this data set. You can think of this as drawing a wall around a part of the data where the value is some specific number. Streamlines and isosurfaces can be used to convert fuzzy volumetric data into solid surface geometry but you can create derivative data without changing the type of geometry you're working with. A lot of data sets have three-dimensional values like velocity split into three values, velocity in the x direction, velocity in the y direction, and velocity in the z direction. But because the three velocity attributes are components of the same value, you can't exactly layer the three volumes on top of each other, or you just get a mucky mess. What we can do instead is apply a mathematical operation to our three volumes to turn them into one volume that is more meaningful. One option is to take the magnitude of the three dimensions, which will give you a volume that shows where the wind speed is highest. Alternatively, you can use a mathematical operation called curl on the three velocity values, which gives you something called vorticity, which is an attribute that describes spinning motion. That's perfect for when your data set is a spinning tornado, and it's one value which we can visualize more easily than three. All sorts of different mathematical operations can be applied to create derivative data. One useful math trick when dealing with large changes in data values is taking the logarithm of the data. Say you're working with data that crosses many orders of magnitude. 10 billion on the high end, which is one followed by 10 zeros, to one over 10 billion on the low end. And both the high and low values are important, so you don't want to threshold them out. It's hard to design a color map that brings out features at both ends of the data range, because you'd have to cram in a lot of color information into a small part of the color map. Besides, you might actually run into rounding errors, because computers can only store a finite amount of information, so they might not be able to represent both the very large and very small numbers simultaneously. Taking the logarithm of these values will turn them into numbers that are easier to work with. Negative 10 to 10 it's much easier to design a color map for this smaller value range. There's yet another category of derived data that doesn't involve altering the data that you have, but rather creates more of it. If you have an object in your data set that's moving along over time and then your data ends, you may be able to extrapolate that if the data were to continue, the object would keep moving the same way. However, this can be a dangerous assumption to make, since you don't actually know what happens after the simulation ends. Extrapolation is typically frowned upon in visualization for this reason. There's another option for extending the length of your visualization. Rather than adding time steps to the end or beginning of your simulation, you can add more time in the middle to slow down a visualization. This simulation is over really quickly, 
But that's all the time steps that were in this particular simulation. To create just a 10 second visualization at 24 frames a second, you need 240 time steps. What if you don't have that many? What if during pre-visualization, you decide that your data evolves too fast and you want to slow it down for your visualization to last 60 seconds? It's hard to find a data set with 1400 time steps. Thankfully, the amount of time steps in your data doesn't have to equal the amount of frames in your visualization. You can step through the time steps, say showing one time step every 30 frames, but that may create a choppy visualization, which can possibly be distracting from the narrative. A smoother way to play back your time steps involves creating derivative data through interpolation, in which you calculate in between time steps. If you know where a point is at time one and where it is at time two, you can estimate where it might be at time one and a half. You can interpolate your data to slow it down or to retime a simulation if the time steps aren't spaced evenly. In this particular simulation of a planetary collision, the scientist is focusing on studying the initial impact, so she's more interested in the first part of the simulation. The simulation seems to speed up halfway through because the first half has more resolution in time and the second half has less time resolution. Writing out less time resolution during the less interesting part of the simulation is beneficial because it reduces the amount of time steps needed and decreases the amount of computational resources used for the simulation. Here, the final visualization is retimed so that time moves linearly and so that the whole simulation lasts 10 times as long. The data is interpolated so that there is one data step at every frame. This makes it easier to understand as well as more pleasing to look at. But like extrapolation, interpolation isn't necessarily very accurate either so you should be careful when you're using it. If the motions in your data are supposed to be energetic, interpolation would smooth them out and cause slower, unrealistic motion. Because interpolation is an extra processing step, it can introduce additional errors and artifacts to your visualization. Our early drafts of interpolating this tornado dataset resulted in this strange pulsing movement. Some experts consider interpolation an insufficient imitation of the real calculations that they use when simulating or collecting data, which is totally reasonable. Even slight deviations in these extremely sensitive calculations can alter whether a storm produces a tornado or whether a supernova goes off. However, the argument in favor of interpolation for visualizations is that when it's done subtly, it can make the viewing experience more comprehensible to an unfamiliar audience. That's why it's always a good idea to communicate with the scientists who created the raw data set to make sure that your derivative data is representing it correctly. If done properly, creating derivative data is a powerful tool that can change, augment, or extend your raw data set to make your visualization tell a more compelling story. Fun fact, some people create derivative data as an art form. You can take a data set and use it to drive visuals in a way where the point isn't necessarily to communicate science, but rather to create something that's beautiful to look at. Here are a few examples. days where it's a minute away from snowing and there's this electricity in the air you can almost hear it right and this bag was just dancing with me